All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Coaches on Shameless Explorations. Um, today, I'm here with uh, my friend, Juliette, and um, we are going to talk about loving your midlife. And so I know Juliet from the Erotic Blueprint course and Accelerate Evolution. Um, I know that she has a history in so many other modalities. So I wonder what all the fun things we'll talk about today. Um, Juliet, before we get started and you introduce yourself more, would you like to, to take us through ple um, Pleasure First? Yes, absolutely. First, thank you for having me, but I'll talk about that later. <laughs> so I want everyone to close their eyes. And take a deep breath in. Fill your tummy, your chest, and then through your mouth, let it go. And then again, a deep breath in. Hold it at the top and let it go. And a third delicious deep breath in. Hold it and let it go. And now I want you to focus on your toes. If you can, take your shoes off and plant your feet in the carpet or the stones, the wood, the grass, wherever you may be. Take a moment to really connect with your toes to the earth, to whatever surface is underneath you. Focus your attention on your tippy toes and kind of thank them, thank your feet. They've been carrying you probably since you're about a year, 18 months old, everyone has different times when they started walking. But for all these years, they have been carrying you, holding you, keeping you straight. And slowly start to feel, are there any sensations? Is it twirling? Is it swirling? Is it static? Is it moving? Are there any temperatures that um, are starting to change in your toes? Does the quality of how your toes feel, does that change? Do they become more velvety, more plush, more soft, or do they become rigid? Simply become a detective and really become aware of what sensations are available to you there. And then I want you to concentrate on the little web in between your toes, you know, where if you were a duck, that would have like a bigger web there. Concentrate on that part. It's not a part that we often think about. And kind of just see and feel, I mean, you know, notice. Can you feel anything there? Can you feel the earth's energy pulsating, starting to pulsate through your feet? All the while, I want you to just be aware of a really slow, um, conscious, relaxing breath. And be aware of your spine and how the vertebrae are stacking up one by one. It's almost like you um, feel the green energy of Mother Earth coming up through your feet, going up your spine and lighting your whole body with energy. But let's go back to the web there and notice if it has gotten warmer, if it started pulsating, if it's become cooler, whatever has happened, maybe it's become sweaty, Maybe you feel like you want to move. And kind of notice where all these thoughts are coming into your awareness. And simply let them drift in and out. 
And then I want you to take your attention to the top of your foot. And really right to the part where your ankle is. And to almost with your, just with your um, attention, caress them. Mm, send them some love, these ankles of ours. Now, lift your heels and go tippy toes and press down on your big toe. Your big toe stabilizes everything. So without the proper use of the big toe, we're wonky emotionally. We can get really wonky too. And kind of notice, does that create a stretch in your calves? What happens to your shins? Maybe you can feel it in your knees. Your back may want to arch a little bit more and you lean forward. All the while feeling this green energy going up your spine. Now put your, place your feet flat again. And bring your attention to your calves and to your shins. And then I'd like you to place your hands on your kneecaps. Feel them, feel the warmth of your hands. Does that increase pleasure? Take them away for a second. Does that increase pleasure? Whatever brings you more pleasure, do that. For me, it's putting my hands on there. I'm really slowly starting to massage my kneecaps and thanking them for all the times that I've abused my, my knees by wearing super high heels and going downstairs. They really didn't like that. So thank you, knees, for carrying me. And now cup back of your knees, just where it's starting to um, form your thigh and feel the warmth. You may want to squeeze it a little bit more or have your fingers um, reverberate in different ways, different fingers. And then what I like to do is I like to squeeze the sides of my thighs, working my way up to my hips, the IT band. That's super tight on some people. This is why I have some knee problems. So maybe rotate from side to side or do them together. Maybe you want to stick your knuckles in them or have super, super, super soft touch. Just kind of come, become aware. What do you enjoy best? And then I want you to put your hands on your hips and really hold those tight. That is where we store emotions. Often we have hip problems when we have um, emotions that are stored and that we haven't been able to work through. It often has to do with parents as well. We as parents, if we are parents, that's where it shows up as well. And then slowly put your hands on the small of your back where your kidneys are and where all trauma and intense experiences live. And send that some love and some healing. You may want to sway your hips from side to side, moving your back to the left and to the right. Round your back a bit like a cat and then hollow it out like a cow, a bit like the cow and cat pose we do for yoga and on the mat. You can do this while sitting down. And then 
I like to put my hands on my womb. If you're a man, you might want to put it on your groin and actually send yourself some love there. For we who are uh, mothers, it's a very healing thing to do to actually hold the space that was a womb or that is still a womb. Um, and to really feel deeply the warmth that, pe that penetrates, that penetrates from our hands, through our tummy, through our skin, into our organs, and realize how we can heal those parts of us. Yeah, I like moving it up, my hands up, my tummy a little bit. I'm down to my solar or up to my solar plexus, right underneath where your bra strap is, if you're a woman. <clears throat> feeling the energy of the earth come up, feeling your healing hands, bring it up to your heart chakra. Allow that energy to come all the way up, moving through you. And then slowly touch your shoulders if you want to. Caress them. I like squeezing them a little bit. I worked out with weights this morning, so they're sore. <sighs> and then the rotator cuff, it's like move it back. Oh, that feels good. Moving it forward. Yeah, that feels less good. <laughs> and then the other side kind of notice, ooh, back feels really yummy. Yes, I want to stay there. And forward, yeah, not as nice. And then squeeze your upper arms. Moving them down, massaging them a little bit. Knowing that you, yourself, you can give yourself touch. Concentrate on the elbows. I mean, they're a part that we don't often concentrate on. I have hard skin, so I know I need to put some moisturizer on. It's like, send that some love. And then the inside. And then the forearm. Mm. The wrist and start a hand turn. Turn your hand to the left and to the right. Breathing. You may want to sway a bit. Really feel into what your body wants. For me, my right side is definitely dominant, so. When I do this on my left side, it feels very different. I don't think I can even twirl the same way. <sighs> Putting your hands behind your neck, right where your neck meets the base of your head and holding it and seeing if there's any pressure there. Slowly massaging it and going to your temples. Down to your jaws and move your jaws just from side to side. Oh, and if you do that, if you go down enough and you move it from side to side, you'll feel there's a little bit that you can go in. It's like what you use for horses as well. And it's, if you put pressure there, it's a bit excruciating, but it's comfortable <laughs> as well. It's that fine edge between pain and pleasure. And really kind of see if that gives you more pleasure. Oh, and then just finish with your mouth. And <laughs> Tilt your head, swirl it around, 
Put your eyes all the way up to your skull. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Breathe out. And slowly come back to the here and now. Open your eyes, feel refreshed, and kind of notice what's happening in your body. Damn, Juliet, that's so good. <laughs> you like that? That was I good. Am so turned on. <laughs> well, you know, some parts of us might be pulsating. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, darn, I didn't shut off my speakers so I can make all my noise. <laughs> <laughs> so good. You know, that's often we forget that sound mm. movement and breath, you know, and just mm -hmm. <sighs> exhale and let it go and just, huh. it's so, funny because I'm Dutch and um, we in Holland have something like if we've done something really hard, like, like skiing or something, you know, we've skied for about, I don't know, 15 minutes and then we all meet up and we stop and we're like yeah. so it's like a sigh and a sound and I never realized that that's what we do but actually it's so releasing yeah. and when I explain this to people they're like yeah but you've done this since you were born I'm like yeah <laughs> <laughs> well one, one of my favorite things is that you brought attention to the webs between my toes and right? I love that spot. Like when I put lotion on my feet, I'm always like, oh, it's such a good spot. And nobody ever like really in a meditation, we don't get to go to these places. And the elbow, I right. love that. There's so many places that you don't go to. And I, I kind of didn't want to you know, take all hour doing this. <laughs> oh, let's please just it. keep going for the rest. We don't need anything else, just more. Anything else, just do <laughs> meditation. <laughs> But you see how easy it is, right? And how often we just forget. Yeah. But just three deep cleansing breaths can bring you into a completely different state. And then just to bring some awareness to it. And you have, you know, all kinds of mind thoughts that come in and you're like, oh, my God, did I close the door or not? Is the dog peeing inside? I mean, all this, whatever, you know, comes up. <laughs> and, right. just, oh, and then, so I just... I, I'm so off track because that was so good. But I just want to say, like, when you said the dominant side, can I share about you being a dom? Yes. Yes. So just, it's so funny how our systems can get trained. So when we go, sometimes when we're at um, events together, Juliet just becomes my dom. It, it's just so natural that when she's around me, she just kind of takes over and I melt as soon as I hear her voice. And so today I'm extra melty and that's because my body is trained that Juliet dominates me. And when you said dominant, I was like, oh, just the word. <laughs> there you go. I got you well tried. Although I didn't know I had trained you, but <laughs> that's good. Isn't but that's something so that people don't understand about dominant, you know, it's actually, you're just what, what you're doing is you're actually in the surrendered position and you're, looking at what the person in front of you needs so it doesn't matter what i want it's like i'm looking at what your body is telling me that you need what your your psyche just just looking at you I'm like oh, okay this will work yeah and so good so so good you always know what i need so thank you <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure um so okay so now that we have given everybody this amazing ex, ex like experience of who you be <laughs> um would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do yeah absolutely so uh, my name is Juliet as you guys have heard uh, I'm Dutch but I've been living in god I haven't lived in Holland since I moved when I was 14 I came back for a few years and then I left since I was 18 and I'm 52 so yeah you do the maths a long time away <laughs> so I um I live in England. I've been living in London for 20 years, and then I moved just before lockdown, moved to the country. Um, I'm an intimacy and a relationship coach and a sensuality coach. And I specialize in midlife, in midlife women and couples. Um, so they're in long-term relationships. They're happy together, and yet there's no juice left. Mm. So, you know, they look at their wedding pictures, and they're like, where did all my dreams go? Am I still that same person? 
Their children have either just left home or they're in their last year. And they're constantly overgiving. They're constantly doing things for other people. You know, they have a pretty good life, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. They have a, a lovely husband, lovely children, nice house. So it's not like they have a lot of financial trouble, but they just feel like something is missing. And that spark. So that is where I come in and I re, um, reteach them because it's not like they never knew that spark. It's just they've forgotten and, you know, with all these outside influences, with all the, um, the way that society wants us women to be, we're constantly like, it's, it's like running, 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 and never really checking in what it is that we want. So they have terrible boundaries. They're always saying yes. Well, actually, they mean no. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they're like, ah. Oh. You know, when it's Friday night, they're like, okay, let's just pop open that bottle of rosé. And, you know, they drink a bit too much. They shop a bit too much. They might have a bit too much sugar in their life. Um, and they just become a bit bitter in life, yeah? They kind of think, wow. You know, they see, see people in love and they're like, why can't I have this? You know, but they don't even know how to ask for what it is that they want because they don't know what they want. They know what they don't want. And they bitch about what they don't want. But then when you actually ask them, but what is it that you want? They're like, anything but this. Yeah, so that's that, what I help them with. Isn't that interesting that like, um, that, that, that's actually a place to start, right? People, when they're asked, like, what is it that you want? They have no idea. They don't even know where to start. So it's like, okay, so I know all day long, you're like, this sucks, that sucks, this isn't working, that's not working. So, right, like, go to your, I, this is what I don't want list. And what's the opposite, right? Like, so that's really often under, under a complaint is a desire. Mm -hmm. One of my teachers, that's what she used to say. It's like, really look at this, those complaints. And what is underneath that complaint? Mm -hmm. Where's the desire? Can you hear it? I mean, it could be just really, really faint. But trust that. Yeah, trust that desire. So if you're not finding the thing and you just hate everything, <laughs> what's on the other side? Um, and I could totally relate. I know with um, parents of younger kids, like I think that you're working with a different, like come, you know, most of the programs that I've done, um, the women that are in there, I've always been the youngest. Um mm-hmm. I started when I was like 28 looking into everything and and actually woke up and was like something different has to be available to me. Um, But most of the women in there between like maybe 42 and in, in fifties and just like they spent a lot of their life being dissatisfied or settling. Um, And so what is it, what is it that you notice that has them waking up? And, and wanting something new. They don't often want to complain because actually their life is pretty good, you know? On the outside, it all looks good. I mean, their girlfriends would never think, you know, she's contemplating divorce, leaving, leaving her husband. But, you know, every night she goes to bed, the husband's still on his computer working away. Mm-hmm. And she's kind of like, where, where? did that time go that we actually used to have sex and we used to not, we can wait to rip each other's clothes off. Where did that go, you know, with having kids and all of this and stuff. And really when they wake up is when the kids leave and when they kind of are faced with this, like, oh my God, it's going to be like this for the rest of my life. (sighs) Right. I know you can, you can feel it, right. It's just like, dude, (laughs) And, you know, they they try and they go out with friends and they have charities and they go out to lunches and they drink a bit and they shop a bit and they go on a nicer holiday. So it's like, you know, they have all these things at their disposal. And what I get, I mean, I have some some, um, clients in Saudi and one of them that I was on a call was like, well, can't you do the work for me? So it's like, I don't think we'll be a good fit because no, no, no. I mean, however much I want to do it for you, no, I can't. And that's also, you know, where, where boundary work comes in, where for me, it's like I used to overgive and I used to 
give everything of myself to um, to my kids, to my husband, to my partner that you know, after I got divorced, went into exactly the same patterning again. Then we had seven children between the two of us, seven different schools, seven different holidays. So I created a home with eight bedrooms, with everything perfection. I mean, I could have been running an army. I was so organized. And all the while, I was really dry. And I was, you know, I was not feeling great about myself. And then at one, you know, and at one point, there was so much tension between the children. There were boundaries. There were things. There were un unspoken rules, but that didn't apply to some and that didn't apply to others. There was just so much mindfuck that um, my body gave up. I spent nine months in and out of hospital. Mm. Um, I had a heart monitor implanted for two years. I was doing an MRI and brain scans every three weeks. I mean, it was incredible. I went from being a very vivacious and like super, you know, on the go woman to fainting and to needing um, outside support to even, you know, to even be in my home. I couldn't even be left alone, not even for a day. So, um, so yeah, so that's what started all this exploration of, of the psyche, of healing, um, of all these modalities that I've been doing. Yeah, looking at you now, you would never even guess like that that was part of your story, like having your heart monitor and all those things. So what, yeah, would, like, what would you oh, say? Yeah. What's that? I don't have a big scar here. <laughs> mm, oh. <laughs> so what would you say had you um, wake up? Like what's created the biggest shift in, like I know that, so it's hard to ask this because I know like, okay, the first thing is the biggest shift and then you move on and there's something else and then it's the biggest shift again. But like, <laughs> There's always a big shift, right? But for me, it was something really, that can snap you out. it was getting out of a relationship that was toxic to me, okay. to my health, to my children. You know, probably I was toxic to them as well, to his kids and, and, and him as well. So it was just like, yeah, although we adored each other, we just couldn't make it work. And it's, yeah, if we'd had all the tools, yeah, things might have worked out. But, you know, we didn't and we didn't know how to deal with it. So um, so the, the, the biggest shift was for me, actually, when uh, we broke up. Within three weeks of actually going deep into my psyche and learning other things, I was walking again, you know, with help with someone, but I could go five meters without fainting, without falling on the floor, right? So it's like, yay! And within three months, I started driving again. So it's like all these things, all of a sudden, what got into place. It's like I'd lived for so long disassociated from my body. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd had four kids in three years' time. I was twice my weight. And I mean, I like big ballooned whale, and um, then I lost it. So I was really like, okay, with my mind, I'm going to do it. But so very masculine, it's like I'm going to do this with a personal trainer, with a diet, this that. So I did it, but I didn't actually realize that I was punishing my body, mm. and my body also needed some time. And you know, one of my things is emotional eating. Yeah, uh, I've put on a bit of weight again the last three years with my sister and my parents dying. Um, and I'm also not beating myself up about it because it's like, okay, I realize what I'm doing. It. I'm not doing it unconsciously. And um, it's also, but, you know, I'm actually really listening to what my body needs now. So clean eating, you know, I've cut out all alcohol, all sugar, all carbs for now. And I feel so much better. It's like, okay, Jill, start doing what you teach all your clients. So <laughs> <laughs> isn't that interesting? Like, so when it is, I just want to highlight that, that, that you just said, um, sometimes the biggest shift you can make is just to choose to leave what's toxic. And if just doing that creates the shift. You chose me. <laughs> oh, what's that? I chose me. Yeah, choosing yourself, choosing your happiness and your pleasure and your health. Um, and that's on all the levels, right? With your, um, in your relationships, which created some boundaries. And then with your food, which is creating some boundaries again. So let's talk about boundaries. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I know I, I got to say that um, I also have been on a um, low or zero carb diet since mm -hmm. December and just the, the um, sugars, carbs, they create so much um, dis-ease in the body. And so taking that out creates so much more space. I feel amazing too. So I just wanted to acknowledge that <laughs> and speak to it in case if somebody's listening and struggling with their sugar addiction, there's a possibility of moving past it. And <laughs> it's, I, it's funny because yeah, I think also you need to get to a certain point. It's like, okay, this is enough now, you know, and it wasn't, and now it's not difficult anymore. It's just like, I now notice all those little nuances, like, you know, the web of your feet, you start noticing those little nuances, how your body feels. You know, the other day, what did I have? I had something. Um, oh, I think I had had something prepared, but I had some chorizo or something that wasn't just proper meat or, or, or you know, or veg. Um, but it was just the next day, I was like, bloated. Oh, I had gas it was I was like okay no we're not eating that again yeah it's so interesting that when you um take out the things that aren't working as soon as you put in one of those things your body's like immediate uh this doesn't work <laughs> you were doing good a minute ago let's go back <laughs> right yeah your bodies are so smart <laughs> so yeah and I think for me what um I thought I was having pleasure in life but actually, I was just doing, 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 running, running, running around for people. You know, my one hour for me was Pilates from eight to nine in the morning or seven to eight. Either seven to eight or eight to nine. And that was like, and I get really pissed off if the kids needed me for something. I'm like, no, <laughs> not that hour. That's my one hour. And they're like, mommy, you're at home all day. I'm like, yeah, but I'm doing this, 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 that. Oh, so man. Yeah, let's talk. Go ahead. I said, so choosing me was really tough. Yeah, also, and especially as a mom, right? Because they like, oh, if you're home all day, then people look at that like, oh, you have all the time because you're not going to work. <laughs> I've experienced that because I've been at home with my daughter since I was one. And I was in a relationship where he's like going to work all day. And then he comes home. He's like, well, you were just home. <laughs> like, yeah, well, there's a lot done at home. There's a lot to running the home, running the kids. There's a lot to it. Right. <laughs> Not just being home. There was no sitting on my ass, like eating bonbons. <laughs> How nice <laughs> that would be. <laughs> yeah, no, but I must say when, um, when all of this happened, the, you know, my, my children were so supportive. Mm. Um, yeah, and then I went deep into psychology and into the psyche and in all kinds of healing modalities. I took all my coaching diplomas um, and I went deep into sensuality and into actually what it is, what this, this sexual energy in our body is, this chi that runs through us. And that freaked them out a little bit. You know, I had a boy of 15 and one of 16 and the girls were 13 or something at that point or 14. And they're like, mommy, yo, <laughs> you know? So that was actually really difficult for them to see their mother as, you know, a sexual person because mm -hmm. it's me with my husband, with their father, obviously, and then with my partner afterwards. So, you know, that was acceptable and that was in the norms. But all of a sudden me talking about it in public and teaching others about it and it's appearing on my Facebook um, feed, they're like, mommy, this is really embarrassing. We've got boys, you know, my friends are asking, what is your mother doing, you know, with all the sensuality and she's so open about it. So that took a while to get used to that, um, yeah, that they found that openness found that quite difficult, you know, and then and a lot of coaching through, through, you know, and, and getting to hear their feelings mm -hmm. without making it wrong, without making myself wrong, without dimming myself and without, you know, because the easiest thing would have just been like, okay, well, never mind. I'll just, you know, put it away and I'll just tuck up and I'll just be, you know, stiff yeah. upper lips, as they say in England, and just, you know, don't care about myself. But I really held up for myself and I said, no, this is not right. This is, you know, this is who I am. And, um, you yeah, know, I understand that it might be 
frustrating for you to have a mother who's so open and <laughs> <laughs> talks about this openly. And the funny thing is now that they're 22 and 21 and the girls are 19, the twins are 19, they're like really chilled about it and they're happy that I can actually talk to their friends about everything. Well, that brings up a good point in, in um, anytime we do our self-work, right? And our transformation, our self-work, um, we start to change and then the people around us start to notice and we come out of that norm that their comfort level of knowing us, right. And we become somebody new and we're getting to know ourselves and they have to get to know us. And so that brings up like, we have to have more conversations and about, you know, um, and give them an opportunity to see like who, who are they and how are they functioning and what can they be? Um, and, and can I have this space to explore me? So that it brings up a lot of conversations, right? Um, and that has to do a lot with boundaries. And if you never learned boundaries, then, then like I, so I didn't learn the word boundary as it related to people or me and my mm -hmm. body until I was like 28. And when somebody was talking about, it, I was like, wait a minute, I can say, I don't like that. All right. It's the most. No, what? <laughs> I can say I want something different. <laughs> So let's let's just talk about boundaries for a minute and how to isn't how to that beautiful and, right mm -hmm. that moment when actually someone teaches you and it's like feed into your body is that a yes you know and come up a whole bunch of how i did it's like a whole bunch of questions it's like um does your body want to be touched now and you kind of like close your eyes and i mm. Yeah, it's like, yeah, means no, you can always, you know, you can always go to yes, but you know, at the moment, just kind of like, oh, no. And it was what for me was really empowering is that I didn't need to give an excuse. I didn't need to say, oh, yeah, no, I can't, but yeah, you know, but because of this and that, but actually just no is okay. You don't need to say anything why or not. And then by putting myself first and putting what I wanted first. Slowly, I put up these boundaries and my kids at first hated it. You know, like, you're so selfish and this and that. And it was, sometimes it was quite tough sticking, um, sticking to some of the things that I really wanted them to do. And I said, hey, you know, I hear that, you know, it's tough for you. And you know, this is some ways that mommy is changing. So, you know, so they've grown with me. Um, but yeah, like you said, like that moment when you're actually deciding like, oh, wow, I can do things the way that I want. And why have I kept myself small so long? It's kind of like this is light bulb moments. Like if I'm not going to be living my life, you know, no one's going to be doing it for me. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to be stuck in some life that I don't actually want to be in. Yeah. And then that's when it's like, well, how do I come out of it? How do I come out of that? Yeah. When and for me, it's been, been great, actually, boundaries. I've also cut out some people out of my life that, um, that you know, I know they always say no longer serve you in the, the woo-woo world, in the coaching world. But actually, it's, it's you know, you've outgrown friends. You, you know, sometimes you're not the same anymore. And, and you know, when you do inner work, you're not the same. And some people you absolutely love and will always have in your life. And some people come in, into your life and come out of your life, you know, for a reason. And they were there, maybe something to teach you. And then also some people were actually there to teach you boundaries. Yeah. I've had a lot of people like really negative and sucking energy out of me. And I've just gone, deleted them from my phone book. <laughs> don't, don't see them anymore. And it feels great because that then create a, creates a lot of space, which I can you know, do and create other things with. Yeah, sometimes that transformation does it. It pulls people who aren't, creating like contributing to your life and lets you see that just lets you see like okay what is this relationship looking like what is this doing for me what am I doing for them what are they getting out of it what am I getting out of it? is this a mutually um what are you getting out of it? I mean often that is the things like oh like why was I giving coaching away for free what was I getting out of it yeah. it's like oh this this deep need to be you know to be useful yeah. It's like, and once you start looking at those little patterns, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I am getting something out of it. Yeah, and then that person becomes a gift, and it's okay to say goodbye to them. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so good, good. So that's, um, yeah, I love that, that idea. We, we tend to think that we keep everybody around and try to make them happy. But when you turn it into like, what is actually making me happy? That's when you're actually choosing you and choosing your life. So thank you for speaking to that. Um, yeah, and what, what gives you energy? So, I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm cutting through my Facebook feed. I'm just looking at people like, if I haven't heard from you in a while, if you're not active on my feed, then, you know, I'll send you a message saying, hey, follow me on Instagram instead. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> culling, culling um, Facebook a bit. That's great. So, yeah, that's a, that's a big energy leak, right? Some, we have so many people that are friends or their posts piss us off and we think that we have to keep them on there for some reason, um, some socially acceptable reason. <laughs> but it's, it's so okay. great when you don't, you know, you don't think that way anymore. No socially acceptable things anymore. I mean, I used to lead this um, conscious sexuality organization in London and we brought the first coaching program to London for over 110 coaches. So, I was friends with at least 100, if not 200 people of this community. And I haven't heard from some of them in years. So I'm just like, okay, <laughs> tick, 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 off you go. And you know, it's not like I'm pissed off with them or anything, but it's just like, okay, let's just make, you know, make new for some other new energy to come through. So what does that do? Like when you're, when you're, when somebody's there and it's not serving and you actually choose to let them go, what does that open up in your world? For me, it opens up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And um, when I started doing this, like a few, about two weeks ago, um, I started doing this and then my Instagram account went from 700 to 4,000. So and not not all the people that from, from, in, from Facebook went there, but just all of a sudden it took off and it's like, oh, okay. So it's all of a sudden you're in more flow. Mm -hmm. um, I've been asked to write a chapter for a book, which uh, I need to submit next week. So I've got one week to do it. It's, like, ah. <laughs> it's a book called She Made It Happen, um, which will be out in August, 21st of August. So uh, yes, yeah, so all these kind of things all of a sudden show up. You know, all of a sudden a client from Saudi, you know, someone from Saudi had seen my, one of my posts and tracked me down and wanted to work with me. So it's just like all these things, all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's, because you haven't been bogged down energetically, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of a sudden you're, you, your energy reaches other places. I yeah. know that sounds a bit woo, but. You know, so there's exactly actually true. something really to it. Oh, um, it's called an energy leak. And if you have people in your life or things in your life that you're spending your time and energy on, like, um, I don't know, uh, video games, if you were to stop doing that for a day or two and look at all the time and space that you have, it doesn't, like I'm just saying, it doesn't have to be a person. Um, the time and space that you have when you're not doing that thing that just distracts you and, you and then you're like, what productive thing can I add to this that would contribute to my life? then that energy stops leaking in that direction and then it opens up to all these other places. So um, there really is something to that. And also where can you bring in more pleasure? Mm -hmm. you know, where is it that because of doing all these things, you're actually numbing yourself? Like you were mm -hmm. saying, video, um, I noticed social media. You know, how often do we go on Facebook or social media? And we just, yeah, we just kind of like, before you know it, you spend an hour and a half reading other people's posts instead of actually posting something yourself. Right. And getting pissed off about it, maybe. Yeah. This is like, Oh, I don't actually need this. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. so I have like a hard boundary at 11 o'clock. My phone goes off until six o'clock in the morning. I just, I can't do anything. I mean, obviously I can if I want to, but you know, I just like, it's like, no, that's my boundary. Um, you know, I have a few things. I don't call people after 10 o'clock ever. You know, if my kids want to call me, fine. But, you know, I'll never call someone after 10 o'clock because it just feels disrespectful. And that's just one of my boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. So let's talk more about um, loving your midlife. Yes. Yeah. So I have just started, or I'm in the middle, actually, of uh, doing an online course or making an online course, not doing. Um, so I'm about to start filming next week with that. Um, so in it, you really have modules. You get modules every two weeks so that 
the person people can um, study at their own pace. Once a week, there's a Facebook um, coaching call. And uh, there's obviously the, the Facebook community, uh, only for the people that are taking the course and you get lifetime access to the course. Mm -hmm. So that feels really good um, because there've been so many people that I've actually just taken through the same steps and it's become a method. So it's called loving, you know, the love your midlife method <laughs> because it doesn't need to be for midlife, but I've noticed that lately for the last year or so, um, and actually, especially since my mother passed away, you know, um, I had my sister pass away two, two and a half years ago, my father a year and a half, and then my mother exactly a year ago. So I was so busy holding them that all my energy went to that and caring for them, etc. So that all of a sudden, after my mother passed away, I've um, moved house, I found the house that I wanted with my partner. So all of a bit, certain things started falling into place, mm -hmm. you know, again, with energy, right? Uh, I found the house that I wanted out, outside of London, moved in with my partner, we moved together. Um, all of a sudden, all these clients, these midlife clients in their, their 45, 50s start showing up, and they all have the same problem. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I don't have that much one-on-one -on -one time anymore. Let me just make a course that people can study at their own pace. They'll have the um, the Facebook group and they have once a week coaching with me in that group. And of course, if people want to do it privately with me, they still get access to the course and then they do private one-on-one -on -one coaching. So basically that's the midlife bit. Mm -hmm. And also what I've been doing is testing and pre-testing -test accelerated evolution and pre-testing accelerated evolution people. And I know that you're one of them. You, you just got your certification. Uh -huh. Yeah, I had Linda on last week and she was helping me to get through that. Um, all the right, work right? certifying. Um, yeah, I think it's amazing that you've stepped into being that master trainer. Yeah, and no, I'm really enjoying it. So, I mean, that I noticed, um, I started doing that after my father had passed away, but while I was dealing with my mother and preparing her for her euthanasia. So I would do a process of accelerated evolution every day on myself. And I'd have, obviously, the master coaches exchange with me as well. And honestly, it's one of the things, together with EFT, together with tapping, that has kept me sane. You know, having communities and having people like this that can actually hold you while you're going through this kind of grief is super important. Yeah. So, yes, I'm excited to do that. I've heard you say, like, mo multiple things. Like, in your midlife, the struggles that happen, like, there are some legit things that come up. I'm not there yet. I haven't experienced, like, the death of my mother. Or mm -hmm. um, So, I, yeah, support through that time seems crucial of uh, like having somebody like or tools or a system or like something there to support you when you start losing your parents and siblings and um, your house is empty I don't know I'm gonna probably come crawling for help <laughs> I have well, that's it, right we've got all these empty nesters and we're like <laughs> when Mabel moves out what will my life be like I, I, I like my life is based on being you know, um, being a mom, that's your mom, right? Being Mayla's mom, right? <laughs> and so when that's empty, it's like, there's a, a huge energetic space that just opened up. What do I put in it? Right. And, um, and that's, that's the thing, you know, you can either channel it into something positive, like you said, or then it can go into, you know, drinking, uh, yeah. whatever, game, shopping, an affair whatever you know <laughs> but that is what happens because the roles change mm. you know we go through our life and we have these personas that we take on you know, at the moment where I'm being interviewed so I'm an interviewee you know and my goal is that I want to you know come across in a way that you you understand and that your viewers might like and just you know they understand they get me <laughs> but, you know I'm also a role of my of a mom you know I just talked to my sons who were having problems with their landlord so I mean so until I got in this call I was in a role of a mother I've just yeah. seen my partner outside so I'm also in the role and the persona of a partner mm -hmm. yeah so we have all these personas that have goals for us which is fine but when multiple of those all of a sudden drop away 
in the way that we've used to them every single day, it's like we're left with this void. And what do we do with it? Yeah, and it can feel like an emptiness, right? Like a sadness, an emptiness, grief of loss. Um, it can also feel like oh, amazing. I've been stressed for so long now. There's a space open, right? Um, yeah. But I can yeah, see definitely. Like There's like, wow, no, I can yeah. do this now. <laughs> you see, you see all these these, these like yeah, 50, 60 year olds going on cruises and traveling the world. I'm like, wow, cool. That's, that's <laughs> actually you know, kids, you know, like <laughs> not so cool, but <laughs> that's going to be my coping mechanism when uh when Mela doesn't need so much of my time. I'm just gonna be traveling. <laughs> which is great. She can come and visit you. Yeah. I mean, I did the same when I left home. I traveled and my mom and my sister and my dad used to come and visit us everywhere. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I just wanted to point that out, like that there was so many, there's, there's a need for support in that space. And I can, I can see like what a gift it is to offer to that specific group, like knowing the support that's needed and having the tools to, to, to support through. So thank you for that beautiful work that you're doing. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask is um, how do how do people find you if they'd like to work with you? I'm in the middle of redesigning my website. So that should be done in about three weeks, <laughs> but that's um, feelfullyyou.com. Mm-hmm. So any emails, Juliet with double T E. So the French spelling Juliet double T E at feelfullyyou.com. My um, Instagram is Juliet again with double T E Caraman K A R A M A N. And I'm on Facebook, Juliet Caraman and then a very long, Van Schardenberg, very long Dutch name. But if you just Google Juliet Double T E Caraman on Facebook, you'll get me. Just know that there's a very long 17, <laughs> 70 letter last Dutch name after that as well. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Um, is, and is there any other um, insights that you'd like to offer? Like if somebody could take one thing away from today and apply it to their life, what, what would you like to offer? I'd like to offer to actually slow down, take three cleansing breaths, and you can do this multiple times during the day. Really take three breaths, check in with yourself, and really move your body in a way that you can that just might be a stretch or that just can give you a bit of pleasure. And for me, what, everything that I do, every Day, what I do is gratitudes. I write down three gratitudes. I've been doing them uh, verbally lately, but I notice when I actually write them down and then I go through my journal a year later, I'm like, oh my God, all those things. <laughs> all those things that you're grateful for. Because the more that you're grateful for things, the more um, of that energy you bring in. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. I want to piggyback off of that and say, um, when uh, my daughter was little, me, I think like four or five, she would, she was just so negative. I wasn't sure like she would, one bad thing would happen in the day and that's all she'd talk about for the rest of the day. And so at nighttime I would have her, um, I would have her, we started saying like, I would ask her, um, tell me three things that you're grateful for and in your life in the day and tell me your favorite part of the day exactly so, right is not that perfect yeah. i used to do that with the kids as well yeah i started implementing with them they're, they're you know early 20s and, and late teens so now when i started implementing with them before we actually eat um i have them set the table and exactly you know what they want they all have different plates and different you know we we, we like our plates and cutlery so uh when they all have like different styles so i have a whole collection of plates and cutlery <laughs> um but then we'll, we'll start with what they're grateful for of what happened today mm. and then what are their best qualities which is really tough for them to say it's like oh mommy you know it just sounds like i'm boisterous i'm just like you know i'm bragging and i don't want to be bragging this that. i'm like no listen what are three qualities that you really admire about yourself? And if they found that difficult, I'll just tell them to admire, you know, to tell them about their sister or about, you know, about me, what do you admire in me? And funnily enough is that's how you build up that muscle of yeah. actually uh, noticing 
because that's it. Stay curious. Notice everything that's going around in your world. Thank you. That's beautiful. I love it. And then like these tools that we learn for ourselves, it's not just for us. Like it's not a selfish exploration. Everybody that's involved with us gets to also learn and grow from it. So um, I'm super grateful for that. And I'm super grateful that you joined me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was fun. And thank you for the delicious meditation at the beginning. It was so good. My body is still on. Um, I super duper enjoyed it. And um, I would love to have you on again sometime. Cool, cool. Anytime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Right. So everybody, um, uh, so you can find me at holly at shamelessexplorations.com and um, we do, I do these every week on Thursdays in Facebook, uh, in my Facebook group called um, Shameless Explorations Group. So go ahead and if you found this somewhere else, go ahead and join that group and, and I'll see you the next time. Okay. <laughs>